Tim, I have to start by saying happy birthday. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here with you on this day, on this special day. Which I, I mean, I should have, should have at least looked on Wikipedia and worked out that it was today, and I didn't. And that's that really says something about your. My research was more thorough than Wikipedia. Yeah. Let me put it that way. I wasn't just looking at your Wikipedia going. Okay. I did... My Wikipedia is weird. I don't want to look at mine. I'm too scared. Yeah. I, I looked at yours says. today. Mm. Uh, just to remind myself. <laughs> that it's not my birthday. <laughs> that it's not your birthday, yeah. <laughs> I really <laughs> want, I cared. I was like, I hope it's not her birthday. That would be rude <laughs> and awful if I didn't know. <laughs> I can only hope that this chat is uh, a good part of your birthday. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying it so far. Oh, good. Um, I've already offered you a tea with oat milk, which is all we had. And yeah. you're highly allergic to cats, so we've locked Simon yeah. away. But it's all going well apart it from that. It hasn't been amazing. Although I did have a wee in your very nice downstairs loo. Thank you. It's gorgeous tiles. It is nice. And I like to have a scented candle burning when it gets I comes really around. noticed that it's too. Quite I strong. thought, what is Fern trying to cover up? <laughs> <laughs> what is she hiding? What olfactory <laughs> Nothing. sins she burying under this scented candle? It's just very strong. It's beautiful. It was so it's strong. Lovely. Um, I wondered if it was especially for me, like a, a birthday candle. <laughs> you can take it on your way out if That'd you really great. want it. Um, my you... PR just gave me a dozen donuts for my oh, wow. birthday. And I thought, mate. How can you eat that many? Well, it's so lovely, but donuts are... Donuts are I mean, you can't eat 12 The donuts. evil ones that we know the name of. Yeah, we well, get the evil ones. Creams, yeah, they're so ones. beautiful. I yeah. mean, they're, they're very sugary, but they're sort of on my banned substance list. Because they're almost like eating air. Like, yeah. you don't feel full no, up. So you right. could p do a couple you could go easily, it. yeah. and it's yeah. never wise. Yeah. Um, but you are, of course, in the UK at the moment because you had the Matilda premiere this mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. And I'm imagining this feels a bit like a second home to you, considering how much time you've spent here. You've lived here. You were born here. Your kids were born here. Yeah. Does it feel quite homely yeah, still? Yeah, hugely. And sort of more than that, it feels like my... There's a version of me that was born here in, in, like as an artist. Like mm. my career sort of really took off here. And I felt seen here. For the first time, and then Matilda. And so the big, big things that changed my life as an artist happened here. And, and I mean, I don't, don't want to sort of make any Australians feel like I'm sneering at my beautiful, beautiful home, that, you know, I've gone home. But, um, but if I hadn't had kids, I would not have left London. Really? Uh, yeah, this is my place. It's so cool that we totally got you and embraced you from day one over here. Mm. You're sort of perfect UK fodder. Yeah, I didn't realise Yeah, that. But that's what it really felt like in 2005 because I'd been chipping away and doing all this stuff and I hadn't quite realised that the skills I had accumulated through 10 years of rejections, you know, the sort of all that chipping away and all that sidestepping and like doing a bit of cabaret and doing a bit of piano and a bit of acting and a bit of original bands and cover bands and all that. Then with my theatre background and my theatrical style of songwriting, yeah, it, was, it it appeared, I think, to the UK industry that I'd popped out of nothingness yeah. completely formed when, of course, it had taken a long, long time. But, yeah, it suited. There's something about British comedy history, which I, I literally knew nothing about, but it, my style really related right back to kind of end of the pier stuff and vaudeville and things, mm. and I didn't really know that. I wasn't deliberately doing that. But I think I, I turned up at the, the sort of towards the end of the kind of 90s independent shuffling in a T-shirt comedy thing where, yeah. where it's all about you'd rather be dead than be seen to be worrying about lighting cues or wearing makeup. Yeah. And I came in with a list of lighting cues going, this is your blackout, this is, you know. It was, Here's some eyeliner, yeah, let's go. That's right, yeah. Mm. Razzle dazzle. Absolutely. Um, and with Matilda, I know you had the, the premiere for the film and um, you've obviously got a long-standing history with this particular story. Mm. How did you approach the film in comparison to the musical back in 2010? Well, the short answer is I didn't. I right. mean, I... The, the songs are the text yeah. and it wasn't my problem. Matthew Watchers, who directed the stage musical and for people who don't really know how a musical is built, calling him a director is almost not, he's the architect of the thing. I mean, Dennis, wrote, Dennis Kelly wrote the script and I wrote the music and lyrics, but it's Matthew's piece and very happily Netflix and Sony, you know, al allowed him to direct the film and the challenge of doing so, which I could bang on about 
for ages and I can talk about how incredibly hard it is to make that adaptation and how incredibly successful I think Matthew was, but it was not, I just sat in Australia and went, you guys are doing great. But <laughs> I did have to be involved in conversation about what to cut. Right. And I did write a new song. I wrote a new uh, ending. And I've heard you say that seeing the cast of of Matilda the movie, uh, singing your songs has been one of the greatest highlights for you. What was it about these particular actors singing your songs that really worked for you? Well, the experience of being a sort of songwriter from WA who ended up having my songs sung on the West End and Broadway and stuff is, is baffling anyway. And and the perhaps the greatest pleasure is having someone like Chris Nightingale, who's the orchestrator and the person who wrote the score for the film, take my songs, which are, they have a lot of complexity and stuff in them, but I don't know. I, I can play all the bits in and go, I think the flute does this and I think this and... Chris takes all that slightly naive stuff and turns it into real incredible stuff. So that hearing my music find form outside of me is incredibly exciting at every step. There is something about Emma Thompson singing the songs I wrote in, uh, you know, in a in a dusty studio in Islington in two thousand and eight. I I think. You can't quite believe it. I mean, I've loved Emma Thompson for 35 she's years. one you know, of the greatest and, humans on the earth. Yeah, she's absolutely incredible. And then Lashana Lynch, who I didn't know so much of. I'd seen her in a Marvel film and I and and I, I thought she was an incredible actress and incredibly charismatic, but I, I had no idea whether she could sing or not. And, and Matthew said, oh, we're casting Lashana Lynch. And I went, good, can she, you know, can I... I mean, it's not up to me. I'm not the casting person, but can I hear her voice, please? And this demo comes back of her singing My House, and I just went, oh, wow, this is great because she, because I care very much about truth much more than, you know, she doesn't have a big operatic soprano. She might have, but she didn't use it, but she just tells the truth. You know? Yeah. And then Alicia, of course, the kid who is just a baffling talent. Yeah. Um, But I think what's so thrilling about the film, and there's so much I can say about it, I think it's incredibly emotional. But what's thrilling for me as a composer is when you see your songs on stage, musical theatre, there's always a compromise going on because, you know, the microphone is buried in the hair of the child and the child has a tiny voice because they're a child and, you know, actors have, you know, you're in a 1,300-seat theatre so they can't all project their voices to the back. And so you're relying on technology and then they're dancing and then the orchestras, there's 15 instruments and you're always like trying to make sure the voices sit so you can hear every word, but you want the music to be really dynamic and you're always like right on the edge of not being able to... In the film, it's just every word is clear. And mm. for someone who cares very much about words and sticks a lot of them in my songs, it's amazing to to have a version of Matilda the Musical where the sound mix is just perfect. Oh, well, I mean, a thrill to listen back to and yeah, to see on that big cool. screen. And you are the perfect person for any Roald Dahl film, quite frankly, because his work is notoriously, you know, has that sort of fun, adventure, levity, but also has a real darkness about it, much like your work. And obviously the songs that you've created for Matilda are so loved and have real meaning and resonance for different reasons to different people. Quiet being one that is so loved. And I know that you've had many parents more specifically talk to you about the meaning of that song for them in particular when they've got neurodivergent kids because it it speaks to the kid. It's a a real true understanding of, of what that feels like and and the song even in its tone and and the change of the song halfway through expresses that. How I know you because is it your daughter who has a S D, is yeah, that correct? Yeah. 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 Was that in mind when you were writing it or no, because were you just kind I didn't of know channeling my, it? I didn't know my daughter had ASD when I wrote that. And she was two. And uh, I, it's just been such a gift that I've had so many people talk to me about that song with their kids who, who especially like kids, like non-verbal autistic kids and stuff who tell their parents that um, that, that song is, is how they feel, you know. Uh, that's an amazing thing for me. I, I remember writing it. It was a song I wrote the first draft of that moment that I knew I wanted a song. We wanted a song when at that moment where Matilda finally, the uh, the power of her mind finally kind of breaks down the barriers and she that's the superhero moment, the, the superpower moment where she moves the cup with her eyes, which comes quite late in the story. I knew I wanted to try and 
I, I wondered what that might feel like and I wanted that to be the, the, the song. And I started with that it felt magical. It was a real sort of Disney instinct or a bit like Billy Elliot singing Electricity. I thought it's it's the moment where she's like, oh, and then that was really daggy and not dull. And so that went in the bin. And then I thought maybe she, maybe the irony is she's this tiny little girl and it makes her feel big. So I was going to do a song called Big. And then like it slapped me in the face that Mrs. Wormwood sings a song called Loud and says what you have to be is loud. And I thought, well, in the second act, Matilda needs to talk about the importance of quiet. And then that made me think, imagine being that smart at six. Imagine that must be noisy. It must be hard to manage having a, a machine like that in, in your head, a, a computer like that in your head. And so that's where that came from. And and I had already established this harmonic language of semitonal movement, which is used in the beginning of Hammer and it's used in Bruce. It's the same and uh, I thought, oh, it just builds up and builds up and builds up. And then what happens when the power comes out is release. Mm. And, um, and yeah, <clears throat> I, I, I like the song. And then, yeah, and then, and then years and years later, my daughter at 13, like, like all Aspie, ASD girl, like many, many ASD girls, they hit puberty and they the girl, girls are harder to diagnose because they're very good at masking but what that means is for their whole lives they've been doing twice as much work as a neurotypical person to try and pick up social cues and figure out how you're meant to act and all that and they're very very good at it so you don't necessarily notice except that Vi's always had separation anxiety and very difficult changing but we just didn't know we didn't yeah. know we didn't know what we didn't know and she like many ASD girls hit puberty and the social complexity of the world around them you know girls hitting puberty it's just suddenly huge you can't no one you even neurotypical girls struggle to figure out yeah. what the hell's going on in the social structure around them and and the kind of a bit like matilda the the build-up of the pressure and the effort required to stay a normie just makes them depressed it just flattens them and it's really common and so when we took and of course it's the COVID year and there's a lot of other stuff going on so we're like oh we've just got one of those kids who's not coping and we take her to a psych and quite early the psychiatrist went have you thought she might be on the autism spectrum and we're like yeah no, I know why you think that she's just a bit unusual but no, like but we didn't know what we didn't know and uh yeah so it's a I have this really strange relationship with autism in my life and the kind of other coincidences that the song I wrote for Violet my daughter when she was three weeks old uh, white Wine in the Sun, which has slowly over the 15 and a half years of her life become more and more and more well known. Um, the proceeds of that song have always gone to autism research. Mm. And I did that because I have another family member with autism from my, you know, one of my cousins. And uh, I've always been interested. And so, yeah, it's like, I don't know, there's something about, I'm obviously, I, I don't think I'm neurodivergent at all, but I've obviously, there's something in the way I think and what I'm interested in that just drew me towards wondering about that stuff and maybe yeah. putting myself in that position a bit. It's interesting how <clears throat> more recently, maybe in the last couple of years, and maybe it is a reaction to the pandemic, I'm probably making huge assumptions here, but so many more of my friends have been diagnosed as adults, many of them women as well, and, and, ADHD, and, and with right. ADHD. Yeah. Because again, with the different presentations of ADHD, females get completely missed when they're kids because their presentation will be more inattentiveness rather than hyperactivity. Yeah, yeah. So they're daydreamers and they get passed off as daydreamers. And then they, as you say, get to puberty. Or oh, like one of my friends in her 50s was diagnosed this year with having ADHD. And she was like, my whole life makes sense to me. And she's had 50 odd years of not being able to understand why she hasn't been able to move through the world quite as easily in certain ways. I, I have a someone very close to me who's been diagnosed at the same age, a woman. And is your friend grieving the life she could have had if, she, if she'd mm. known earlier? I think she's made a lot of peace because of it. Mm. She um, she didn't have children. I think she's she's kind of found a peace with she feels like she's not sure she personally would have coped with that amount of 
sort of everything that comes with being a mum. Yeah. And I think it's helped her really find a peace and she felt very unsettled about it before her diagnosis. So I think it's actually been, I know it's different for everybody really and is, your yeah. own life experience will completely vary. But for her, it's been, like, I think, a very liberating diagnosis. Yeah, well, Violet's diagnosis was just so incredibly important to her. Yeah. Because it gave her context. <laughs> and it stops you beating yourself up because what girls as you say, they're diagnosed as often because their ADHD behaviour doesn't manifest as being chaotic in the classroom or punching people or, you know, a lack of behavioural control. They, they, they're called lazy and stuff because yeah. ADHD affects your um, higher order function, you know, your ability to order your intent and to, to tick off things in a list, mm. you know. And so girls get called sort of belligerent or lazy or whatever and yeah so a diagnosis can validate you hugely and make you go oh, I've just got different challenges and of course with a diagnosis comes drug help which can and often does completely yeah. change people's lives for the better yeah or just any other practical tools or having yeah. like if you're in school having extra help having yeah, someone totally. that is assigned to you know making sure that you have that extra attention and yeah. care so I think I think we've probably historically feared diagnosis or like we feared labels we don't yeah. want to put a label on it but it surely then leads to solutions or at least help mm. to give it's people really, other options it's a very interesting time because yeah. the diagnoses are it's there's so many there's so many more than there were 10 years ago mm-hmm. and Violet being Violet you know has read everything and you know, she read the DSM-5 and she just read everything about autism and recalls it all very well. And um, there's a, a sort of seminal book called Neurotribes by Sylvan. I need to read that. Um, and what it sort of tilts towards is saying well, what we need to understand is there there are neurotribes. There are different groups of people who have different ways of their brain working and we need to actually adjust the world, not the people which isn't to say you shouldn't medicate and all that stuff, but what we need to do is adjust our attitude. Yeah. So if your kid is on the autism spectrum or they have ADHD or they're neurodivergent, what you want to do is get to a world which we're getting closer and closer to. We go, oh, I've got one of them. Okay, that guides me. Yeah. And that's what's been amazing for Sarah and I. It's like, oh, what a relief. I don't ever have to get cross with my child ever again. I mean, it's I'm, I was sort of quite a strict parent because it's how I was brought up and I thought it went pretty well. And so I was sort of a bit resilient, period. like, you know, pull your socks up, stop your, you know, mm. you know, don't be silly, you're being ridiculous, you're being melodramatic, come on. And really pushing her through moments that actually in hindsight probably caused her distress. And so to learn, oh, she's like this and this is what she'll find hard, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, fine, I can do that. Because I heard you said in an interview recently, like even with exam pressure, you've gone, just do like do a mediocre job yeah. because the anxiety, yeah. and I think this goes across the board even outside of oh, yeah. neurodivergent kids, is the pressure. I mean, it's completely different to when I was sort of sitting exams. You know, kids are under this insane pressure that's leading to acute anxiety. That can't be good. And they seem On to any be level. doing it to themselves. Yeah. Like it seems to be a cultural, I don't, I just, I might, it's the opposite of me. I was brought up in a time when I went to a, a boys' school and there was definitely an expectation that I should work. But my entire childhood was my parents going, Tim, go into your room, do some study, you know, like oh. having to push me into staying. I was like, eh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get away with it. I spend my entire parenting, you know, years saying to my kids, just stop. Can you, do you have to do that homework? You've been doing homework for two hours. It's like, mad. It's three hours. And my yeah. boy, my boy's not super quick. Like he takes a long time. And I'm like, Casper, you've got to stop. And he's like, I can't, I have to finish it. I just want to finish it. And it's like, dude, what the, it's, like, it's what mad. has happened? I don't know. I really can't it work it doesn't come out. from us. Do you know what? I've got to do a talk in my kid's school in a couple of weeks. So I think it's next do, week. Do they know? That sounds like a terrible it's idea. It's a terrible idea. Of course it is. But I'm very... <laughs> what are you going to say? I'm going to really use it to yeah, get totally. what I need out of this situation. Yeah, right. Because I think there's so much that's just wrong in the moment. It's so archaic still and Victorian. And, you know, some schools do better with that than others. And I think, you know, my kids' school is luckily quite creative. So that's why we put them in there. 
But I do think there is there is still this structure and also maybe because of social media, there's now an instant comparison to how their mates are doing or how much mm, they're studying maybe. or I don't know. It's sort of imploding on itself, but it's certainly gone wild. So I was I was very refreshed to hear your take on it. Mm. To say because my kids are a lot young. I've got stepchildren who are older, but my kids are seven and nine. And when they get to that exam bit, I am already nervous about that. Yeah. So I don't want to be going, come on, you've got to like study for hours and smash it because what is the end goal with mm. that really? Like we want them to have options and to do well, there but not is. at the cost of their mental health. That's right. We're also people who if our kids don't do well in exams, they're going to be fine. There are, there are you know, if we had a, someone at this table who was a first generation immigrant, that'd be like, F that. Like, yeah, yeah, of course. Fucking my kids are going to work until they get into we didn't come here for shits and giggles we came here for the opportunity you know it's so we're coming from a very privileged position obviously where we know our kids will be fine and if they don't get into uni we'll sort of you know we'll we'll talk to someone and they'll find a way in or you know it's so it's uh, i sometimes think we we want schools it's like people who so i'm just going to digress here wildly you know how people in marriages sometimes make the mistake with a partner of thinking that their partner needs to be everything when actually you can love your partner, but you, you need to have friends and, you know, your sports club and your thing and a, your, your quiz night doesn't have to be, you don't have to do everything together. Your partner's your partner and you get other stuff other places. And I think sometimes we want, school is a factory and it has to be a factory because what we're trying to do is educate every child on the planet, right? So in, in, in Britain, we you want to educate every child well for free. And that is not, a system that is ever going to be very um, bespoke. Yeah, it has to be based on means, on on mediums, on averages, and it has to be uh, structure. And we don't have time and resources to to fulfil the specific needs of every child, and we don't have time and resources to fulfil all the different areas of education you know so my arty friends are like oh this school they, they care about maths and english but they don't care about theater and painting and and i, I sort of part of me thinks school's going to be a factory and your job as a parent is to contextualize that for the kid and to allow them to be good at what they're good at fail at what they're not good yeah. at and if they fail they'll go one of two ways i'll either go screw that i'm not good at maths i'm never going to do it again or they'll go screw that i'm not good at maths i'll show them yeah and work harder and that's fine. And they'll have a teacher who's mean. And I say to my kids, that's part of what you're learning. So yep. you won't click with everyone. Again, maybe I'm coming from a position of privilege. But if the school's theatre is like, well, go join a theatre club or we'll talk about, we'll paint at home. Like yeah. we can't expect schools and we can't expect our partners to be all things to, mm. you know. I think, I sort of think school's a factory. And and it should be because that you, artists come out of, rebelling against I, yeah, of course. I, my kids need something to rebel yeah, against i mean god if their school's perfect then what are they going to say fuck you to yeah, exactly what are they going to write about when yeah. they when they get their punk band together when they're 16 they yeah. need to be like fuck the man yeah don't take the man away <laughs> <laughs> don't take the man away for god's sake um god we've already gone in on schools tim yeah. I, I needed to do that so i like many people out there, I'm a mega fan of what you do for many reasons. And your songwriting and, well, what you create is so complex in terms of how much is in each song or how much is in what you do generally in music. You're not only insanely technically equipped when it comes to playing a piano, but you're very funny, you challenge societal issues, you face your own super, fears. Super good looking. Super good looking. <laughs> Best hair. In the Best, amazingly good Best looking. Hair. Really amazing body. Like everything's going yeah, on. Yeah. Sentimentality, like there's, you, it's all in there. So how, how, do you, how do you know what you're doing? Like what is your aim? Where are you going? Like There's so much there. It's not like one obvious route of, this is just to get a kick. This is just to get a laugh. This is to make people cry. You can sort of do it all. So what, do you have a direction or do you have a a feeling you want people to have at the end of the song due to everything you're capable of doing? Oh, well, that's all nice and makes me want to cry because I, I, I mean, I just am full of self-doubt about my work, obviously, because I, I've never fitted particularly, you know, I, I've been writing songs for 30 years and part of me thinks they're really, really good, but I've never had a song on the radio. Like... My songs don't get played on the radio, except, you know, a couple of my British friends play White Wine and the Sun at Christmas, you know, but <laughs> it, they, they don't belong on the charts and they don't, I don't, I don't know, they're, they're, they're their own thing. 
And I think I write songs like I write them because of all the slightly disparate inputs I had and kind of it's a lack of stuff too. Like every artist is defined as much by what they can't do as what they can do. And what I can't do is write pop songs. I just don't, I try and it doesn't work. What I can do or what I'm compelled to do is firstly to explore harmony, like not always write with the same three or four chords, although I, I, I have increasingly written more and more simple songs. I think that happens as you get older. You think, oh, what am I doing? Let's just, let's just simplify it. I'm interested in harmonic complexity to an extent. I'm not, I'm not a jazzer, but, you know, I have enough knowledge of that stuff that I don't want to just be lazy and play the four chords. And I am not compelled to... I don't like, I like songs that are repetitious, but I don't like writing them. So when I, when you've listened to one of my songs and you've heard a verse, if, if it is as simple as a verse and a chorus, which they're often not, you've heard a verse and a chorus and a second verse and another chorus, at that point, apart from maybe middle eight, most songs, you kind of know the size of the container by then. And with my songs, there's something more coming. There's always more story to come. There'll be a, some ironic change or there'll be a resolution of something set up nearly always and I don't I didn't do that consciously I'm only saying this in hindsight I'm like oh my songs tell stories and I for some reason I just get to a point in a song and I'm like I don't want to just do it again like what are we talking about here so if I look at my record from a couple of years ago this is all very self-indulgent but if I look at if this plane goes down or I'll take lonely tonight you don't you haven't got the full picture until you get to the last note and Mm. I Although I've been frustrated in my time that I'm not on the radio and I don't sell millions of records and stuff, I, I have come to be quite proud of that because I think it's it's kind of theatrical storytelling music. It's why it works in theatre. And it's just my stuff. And, and it's I think, also insanely popular. Like your videos on YouTube have like 17 million views. The numbers are insane. Well, the silly one. They, they, they tend to... The, the in, in in inverse proportion to how much I like the songs, you know, that, that that's kind of typical. But you know, like my, I think my most popular vid is Prejudice, and I've never really liked that song. Whereas a song like Beauty is a Harlot, which I think is a really really good song. Um, or if this plane goes down, you know, it's much much less popular. But I mean, I, I sell a lot of tickets. People come, they come to see me in the theatre because I, I just think it's not like, I don't know who it's like, but it's not very like anyone is it it's like no. you're going to get a big rant and i'm going to over talk and i'm going to overthink and then i'm going to yeah. play a song that takes you on a whole journey and you won't be quite sure whether you're meant to laugh or cry and mm. you'll suddenly find yourself doing one or the other and or both or both yeah mm. and that that to, back to your question to try and answer it is i am very very interested in the tightrope between you know satire irony or or comedy and and tragedy and i guess i i got known here as a comedian but from the very, very beginning, I would come back on stage at the end of my show and play Not Perfect or White Wine in the Sun. I I was always, I'd like to say brave, but maybe a bit self-indulgent about going, right, I've taken the piss out of myself and now I'm going to be totally unironic and you're going to come with me. And not everyone did, but enough people did that it, it's something I've developed. And, and now if you came and saw back or whatever, it... I've really just carved out my, you wouldn't necessarily call it a comedy show, but people laugh a lot through the night, but I'm just swinging back and forth and taking them on different journeys and one song might make you feel a bit uncomfortable and another one might make you feel really sentimental and then it's really, really silly and I do cheese still and, you know, like, so. and I think, um, I think I might. I think I might have ended up in a pretty good place, really. And how's that been touring again? Because obviously you had 10 years where you didn't write a comedy song. And I, mm. I read the Guardian article that you wrote relatively recently saying that mm. there was no sort of major burnout or breakdown or sort of dramatic reason for you to step away from that. It was an issue of temperance and you foreseeing that this kind of fame and touring and wine and adoration probably isn't great for a human in general I think that's right and I think that that's maybe when I wrote that article I was being a bit kind on myself or branding myself a bit because I I sort of defined that as I definitely thought as I I had little kids and I, I would you know it that you walk down the street and people know who you are and it feels good initially and then you just think well, this doesn't feel good for the kids and and more than that, I think my self-esteem is 
some people are fine with it, but I'm probably a bit second childy and a bit fragile and I a bit susceptible to that being observed thing could really make my ego get funny. I think it does to famous people. I think everyone, but the, you just react the way to it I, differently. That's right. The way I describe it is the camera of the self, which should sit behind your eyes, suddenly starts floating out on an invisible selfie yeah. stick. And, and it's not just about like, how are people seeing me? Am I fat? You know, am I ugly? It's just like the camera of the self is slightly outside the self. And you start, you know, people keep, you know, the, the, you, you're, you're both your names, you know, that thing with fame. It's like, you're not Fern, you're Fern Cotton. Yeah. And I'm Tim Minchin. It's like Tim Minchin TM. You yeah, know, it's like yeah, yeah. you become a, an entity. Mm. And I thought that doesn't feel very healthy. But more than that, when Matilda became so successful critically, it gave me permission to take myself seriously because I built my career doing rock and roll nerd and dark. So I was basically saying, look, I want to be a muso, but I'm not very talented. I'm not very good looking and I'm, I've had no suffering. So I don't even write about too middle class to be a rock star. That was my shtick, right? And ever since doing that, which is how I felt, I absolutely, it's true. And I, I, I made hay out of self-deprecation that was honest. But then I thought, actually, no, I'm quite fucking good. And I'm going to see if I can be an artist. I'm going to see if I can be more than a comedian. And I'm not disparaging comedians because I'm not a very good comedian. I was a good entertainer, but, and if I kept working on it, I, th I think I could have been a good comedian, but I, it's not my thing. I'm not a freaking stand up. I'm not Stuart Lee. I'm not in the same league as those people. I just thought I'm an entertainer and I don't want to get stuck here. Mm. I, I don't want to. And I had done, so I'd gone from Tiny Rooms or Gilded Balloon to Wembley Arena with a symphony orchestra yeah. in five years. Mad. From playing cover bands seven years earlier, you know, and not being able to pay the rent. And a part of me went, well, I've done symphony, or I've, I've done the biggest musical comedy show maybe that anyone's ever done. And I did a really good job. I went, this is going to be musical comedy at its most ridiculous. You know, I'm in a cage and 11 minute song about cheese and orchestra and these incredible orchestrators and beautiful conductor. And I thought, yep, that was pretty good. Where do you go from here? Well, sideways. It has to be sideways, right? And Matilda gave me the confidence to go, well, maybe I'll go direct an animated musical and and then eventually maybe I can write television and actually go back to what one of the things I wanted to do, which was act. And and really my story has actually been about arriving at a, the place I am now, which is I'm not even writing music, I'm writing TV scripts. And mm. I mean, I, I desperately miss music when I'm not doing it, but it it's fucking cool to be able to just keep stepping sideways and seeing what else you can keep pushing yourself well like you say in the article you are now a pigeon without a hole yeah unpigeonholeable i love that and i've always i don't know why i think it's just because in my 20s out of necessity because i didn't all the doors were closed you know i couldn't get an agent i couldn't get a record deal i just was always stepping sideways just to make money a wedding band and a covers band and an original band and a you know and then shakespeare in the park and then a little acting job yeah, i got an acting job and trying to do an ad and, and the last thing before i came to england the last audition I had was to be a receipt, dress up as a receipt in a supermarket. How do you commercial. dress up as a receipt? Well, there's like a receipt costume, a you know, like a face of... in a piece of paper. Wow. And the incredible thing about that is I didn't get it. I wasn't even a supermarket receipt. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, That's wonderful. anyway, bloody, I'm banging on That's about myself. That's so brilliant. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think because I stepped sideways so much out of necessity, once things started going well, I thought, well, I've... I've kind of laid the tracks for all this other stuff. You know, when Matilda came to me, they said, have you ever thought about writing theatre? And I could give, I gave them 12 demos. Of... Well, hadn't you tried to get the rights to Matilda years before well, yeah, that? Yeah, I had actually. I'd written to the Dahl estate yeah. to ask about it. I mean, that was a period where I was throwing shit at walls and seeing what stuck. <laughs> the, the story's become like, you've always wanted to write Matilda. I'm like, no, it's just one of the things I tried. Yeah. And, uh, um, but it, that is an incredible coincidence. Yeah. So when you stepped away, I mean, as as much as you could foresee that this was not good for your mental health or anyone's, quite frankly, it's still a terrifying thing to do, to leave the security of that decadence because you know how it works. You know how a tour works. You know how the crowd works. You know your capabilities. You know you could probably push it further. To step away from that is still quite terrifying. It was, except... What did I do? I did. I got Californication, so I was acting on a big American TV show. You know, in that period, I, I was, I got a deal with DreamWorks Animation. I wrote Groundhog Day. I, I, I went and lived in America, and I did tour. I, I, I didn't 
tour and I didn't write new shows, but I would do a live show. Yeah. I did a few little tours and then I'd do sort of sporadic live shows when a deal came through. So I, I, I knew I had to keep my chops up. I was never going to let it go. I was just like, I'm going to put that on pause and try something else. And so I, and because of Matilda, there's no um, financial fear. That was the sort of unspoken but obvious mm -hmm. uh, side of Matilda that apart from all the wonderful spiritual and beautiful stuff is was a life changer. So there wasn't, my only fear was that my self-esteem wouldn't be able to handle the sudden loss of affirmation because that's what we live on us. And that was why I did it as well. I just went, I can't just live on, but it, it didn't fix it. I mean, I when you do what I do, and I've always done it long before anyone gave a shit, the fact is you're, it's like being a drug addict. I mean, you just, you're addicted to people telling you you're special. And when you deny it yourself, it's that's why famous people are fucked, you know, like, yeah. and why it's so hard aging out of fame and stuff is once you're used to being someone that you walk in a room and everyone's interested, it's terribly odd for a human, any human. So how do you deal with it now? Because, like, you've had this huge premiere this week. Mm. You, you did the tour last year and, and at the start of this year. You know, you, you've, you've always acting, putting albums mm. out. There, that element is still there. You are still yeah. heavily recognisable and yeah. renowned for what you do. So how do you, do you see it at a distance? What's the, the sort of coping mechanism? No, I, I think I, I struggle. You know, I think not, not, I'm not, you know, not like, I mean, I'm completely spoiled and I have a wonderful life and I'm basically happy. But I think I, I like when I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm an addict. I'm, I have to work on it. I, when I'm sitting at home writing, I have just terrible, not terrible, I'm not, de they're just periods where I feel really bad about myself. I feel really, this is not sympathy. I'm just being honest because I think it's very relatable for yeah, people. This, it's a metaphor for, it's, it's just, it's just it's a hyper version of what it is to be a human. We, we, we kind of love to pretend humans are a particular type and we're not, we're multitudes, right? We're, I am both a very confident person with a, perfectly good self-regard for my intelligence and my talent and almost simultaneously if not in you know simultaneously someone with huge doubt and you know probably a bit of body dysmorphia and just oh I really just think I'm a fuckwit sometimes mm -hmm. and I think I'm, I'm my shit is yeah. terrible and yeah. pretentious and indulgent and why I'm, I'm never gonna be able to write this script because it's I thought it was good. Why did I think it was good? It's terrible. And then some critic writes something and you're like, well, of course they're going to write that. I'm fucking shit. And, and I, I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm a really mentally, I'm very, very lucky with my mental health and I'm very, very lucky to have a life partner that I've been with all my life. And I'm, I'm so fine, but this is being a human. This is being a human and it gets turned up. The volume knob of it gets turned up when you've had a lot of adoration. It's very fucked up. Yeah. And so I really work on it. And I work on that by, I moved back to Australia. That's all part of it. It's like, what are my values? Yeah. What's good for my kids? I think having a famous parent is very, very tough. You know about that from mm -hmm. various angles. Yep. Um, I don't think anyone wants a famous parent. Nope. Who the fuck wants a famous parent? I mean, how is my son? He, he should be a musician. He should, he'll be a musician. I mean, he's not, he's not a virtuoso, but he can, I can just feel it in him. I don't know. I, I think he might be much better than me and might have songs on the radio, but... Whatever happens, he's not free like I was free. Yeah, I worry about that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's very, it's strange. And you wonder how much you're sort of inflicting pain on them through your own endeavours and desires. And... Yeah, who wants, what kid wants an outstanding parent? Yeah. How, how does a kid feel their self-esteem? How does a kid feel confident and believe in their own value if you have a parent who's constantly like winning prizes and kicking yeah. goals, like Nightmare. what the fuck? I know, because like when I started in telly, my, I come from a working class background. My parents had, you know, very mm. regular jobs. And um, my dad was actually, well, for, until recently, a sign writer. So a very cool job, but like they were, you know, working class people. So anything that I did, even completely mediocre, was extraordinary yeah. because we just didn't know people yeah. that did this stuff. So yeah. I, I totally worry and I do think it is... A lack of freedom at the end of the day because there's an expectation or or then people will say there's nepotism or whatever yeah, involved really, and it's really just hard. oh it's fucking awful you did this um 
uh, talk at the University of Western Australia that, again, I think about four million people have watched this. And it was 74 your nine... million people. 74? Well, I got oh, nicked. Oh, fuck, it... I got that wrong. <laughs> no, I got nicked by a, um, a, that might be wrong, but it got uh, kind of taken and re-edited by a sort of self-help site in America. And right. tens of millions of people saw it. But And I wrote to them and went, I suppose you get a lot of advertising money off that video, yeah, can right? I have some? And they're like, yeah, bye. <laughs> I'm like, fine. <laughs> but it's so interesting because... That was about eight years ago, was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And I wonder if you stand by those nine life lessons now or if you've had any change of perspective over the years. No. So, for instance, I, I really enjoyed the one about don't seek happiness because mm. I'm. that's why my podcast is called Happy Place and everything I do is sort of re revolving around dissecting happiness and what it is and I, I have yeah, no clue. Yeah, I desperately wanted to hear more about... I mean, I've got no idea. I have no idea, H hence why... I just keep working because I genuinely have no answers. I don't, that's feel, right. I don't feel any more content in understanding it, but I think you're absolutely right. It's not, seek it's not seekable. It's not what we evolved to do. Happiness is a side effect. Happiness is a, I mean, ha happiness is a state of the, the mammal you are having, you know, ticked the boxes it requires at the time. And it's always going to be cyclical. There's certainly things you can do to make sure you are mindful and uh, appreciative and there are books you can read and there are people who are miserable. But I just think the solution is not to focus on it. The solution, I mean, in short, I, I stand by it. I stand by that and all the, all the other things, really. I think I, I wrote that speech very quickly because it was just how I think about the world and... My Buddhist friend says it aligns almost entirely with that, and I guess that's lovely. Yeah, I think, well, as I, I think I said in the speech, it's happiness is like an orgasm. If you think about it too much, it goes away. <laughs> yeah. and, and it maybe is really like an orgasm in that an orgasm does happen if you're thinking about the sexy stuff you like. You're not thinking about the, like, oh, I'm going to have this orgasm. You're thinking about the sexy stuff mm. you like or you're having the experience of... Oh, it's so funny. I'm like, I, I'm I'm completely talking about masturbation here. Some people have <laughs> orgasms by having sex. Um, uh, um, but, you know, whatever's in your head or in your feelings, the, the more you just uh, immerse yourself in That was a glimpse that, into your mind yeah, in right. the most wonderful more, way. More, a glimpse into my house. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh. That doesn't. I think there's an industry around happiness, and there's a. I understand why people are, are interested in it and want to dissect it. Um, I suspect. I suspect my version is a bit like your version, which is you just stay busy. Yeah. So that the the darkness is sort of bullied out. Mm. That's by... one thing I'm fascinated about it because like, how much am I trying to control this situation, and how many moments of absolute spontaneous happiness am I missing because I'm trying to control it by essentially being creative which absolutely floats my boat and I know there's almost guaranteed happiness no matter what the end result is but how much room am I leaving for just oh there was just some happiness there yeah and and it's relative as well of course it's relative yeah, yeah, yeah. you know happiness is only is is completely relative it's why lucky fucking people with money like us still talk about it because I have everything I could have possibly dreamed of times 10 in terms of creative satisfaction and relationship and money and a home and um, freedom and respect are just so far beyond my wildest dreams. And I'm one of those lucky people who's been able to experience the truth of the utter cliche that it doesn't make you happy. What I'm no happier now than I was when I was poor. And uh, I, it's it's just it's called the hedonic treadmill. It's hedonic regression. You know, we we revert. It's it's much more about your neurology and what happened to you when your mind was developing, your yep. brain was developing in your childhood. And you kind of there's absolutely no doubt there are people who live very 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 simple lives with very very few material possessions who are very happy, and there are people who are filthy filthy rich who are miserable in fact yep. more i would say yeah and and so you, the the risk is misdiagnosing what you need i suppose i'm just thinking on my feet 
the risk is that you misdiagnose what you need and the obsession with happiness increases the risk of misdiagnosis because you're poking around trying to figure out what it is you want and you think, well, I'll do more of this and I'll get more of that and I'll buy some very nice yoga pants and I'll I'll do my bathroom and I'll, you know, get a fucking pizza oven. And <laughs> Fern, Fern has a pizza oven. Um, and I'll, you I know, or so I'll... so bad about this pizza oven. You give me a complex about yeah, this bloody well, pizza that's oven. That's what I've tried to do. And, and you <laughs> know, or I'll, I'll have an affair or I'll, I'll, I'll make sure my kids get in this school or I'll get a nose job or, you know, and... And what you said that you might be missing stuff, I mean, it's inevitably, inevitably yeah. true in a, yeah. in a capitalist sort of keeping up with the Joneses. Mm. We compare ourselves. I mean, that's, that's the main curse. And then we compare ourselves, find ourselves wanting and try and solve it. And once you're on that journey, you're fucked, right? And when you're someone like me, well, for whatever reason, I'm wired to have when exposed to what I've been exposed to, which is success and um, adoration or whatever, people liking me and thinking I'm clever, my wiring just is insatiable. I, I now, it's worse. It hasn't satisfied it. It's made it worse. I'm now like, well, you know, it's it's really weird. It's, because you need the next level up or you just, just need more need, of it? Just, I yeah. don't know. It just, it's just insatiable. Yeah. And it's, that's something I could work on, but... Um, that makes me sound like a desperate fuck. No, I, I think it's very I, I, honest. I'm pushing, pushing. A portrayal I, of how yeah. most of us feel in our in our working yeah. lives, or or otherwise. Yeah, and I I do all right at making sure that person is not the person I am. It doesn't govern my decisions, and it doesn't, you know. The main thing I do is try and be a really nice dad, and you know, have a lovely marriage, and you know, all that. I I have kept my values in the right place. I've done very well at that. I'm very proud of that. At, at my sort of basically my social conservatism that I have prioritised. And do you think that was informed by your childhood? Absolutely, or how yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm from a close family and I just think I wouldn't want to deny my kids that. And I, mm. I, so I've stuck with my marriage and I you know, do all the other stuff. I don't take drugs and I don't, I've, I've been very wary of not letting my career distract me from my value set, you know. And I think I've done well, but it's, yeah. a, it's a bit of a thing. You have to make a conscious choice. Mm. And I think you're right. You know, so much of the, the foundations for that lie in childhood, which obviously we, we have no control of when we're kids, but how we process that down the line. We've yeah. got Gab or Mate coming on, I think, next week. It'll be put out whenever. Um, and I'm nervous to interview him because... His last book really digs into that and it does look also at the possibilities of neurodivergent kids and the root of that, which also that scares, all of it scares me because I wonder how much I've already fucked my kids up and how much I will continue to because I'm not addressing things that I know need addressing. Does he propose a some causality between something and neurodivergence? What's his... I think he's open to all of it due to his own family history, and but he deeply explores it. Um, but he definitely looks at the cause and effect of childhood to how you see the world, view the world, move through the world. Yeah, I mean, I think it's everything. I, yeah. I, and I, it is scary because you do, as a parent, think maybe there was just one day yep. where I shouted in a moment of development and that become, forms a protein bridge and that's that, that's in there now. Um, th there's no point doing that though. No. And actually all the research shows it's sort of the opposite. That The research really shows that parenting, parenting, schmarenting, that the research shows that the main thing you need to do is never let your kids feel disconnected. Like yeah. Mostly in terms of mental health and wealth and well-being, the, the thing that always causes problems is if you leave them or they leave you or you have a falling out that you don't heal in their teenage years and stuff. Yeah. Pretty much you overthinking your parenting and trying to give your children every opportunity, do you really think you're going to make happier people than your sign writing dad and mum who didn't think about it much at all made? I, that's the thing. Parenting is so different. It's such a different concept yeah. to what it was in the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, yeah. where you'd go, I'm, I love them, I fed them, bye. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. that was enough. And yeah. I think it's got so complicated these days. But I always find it interesting with people that I'm interviewing to see how their childhood experiences have informed how they've reacted to, whether it is success or, you know, some people I've interviewed are just experts in their field, why they've gone down that lane. I think it's... It's always deeply fascinating, but I think you are 
probably the most sensible, famous person on the planet who has had a proper look at it and gone, this is so weird and not great for a brain on a cognitive level. Let's do something different. Yeah. <laughs> but having an awareness of the temptation yeah. still. Yeah, that's right. I Also, I, I got famous to the extent that I'm famous late. So I was already me, which is really important. I already had my partner and my partner was pregnant when things took off. So I was anchored. Yeah. I'm an anchored wanker. Uh, <laughs> this wanker had an anchor. And the the it's really, that's huge. Yeah. You, fame in youth is stunting. We all, we've all heard that. Maybe your listeners haven't. But um, fame is a bit like heroin addiction. Uh, addicts tend to stop. They often are sort of immature because the drug stops them developing and fame I think does very much the same thing it's mm. of course it does you're not going through the normal developmental stages mm. and so I feel very grateful for that but also because of my areas of interest like probably the things I know most about and not like an expert but as it happens the things I've read most about are, are really psychology and philosophy about cognitive biases and yeah. neurological biases I, I know quite a lot about it and I don't believe in free will, so I, I think we're all meat computers that just do whatever. Exactly what you're saying. You you you're just you're just what you're just your genes and the things that happen to you. That yeah. is the sum total of who you are. There's yeah. no there's no soul. There's no higher anything. You're just your genes and what happened to you, right? And so that keeps you that keeps your ego in check. You know, mm. I don't think I deserve credit for who I am to the extent that I do good things and I don't think I deserve blame for who I am to the extent that I don't. It's, just, it's And once you're down that path philosophically, you're kind of in a different place Yeah. from someone who's like, oh, I'm a genius, I'm fucking drugs and bitches, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, nice, you're okay. You should learn a fourth chord, but yeah, you're oh, good. Oh, God, you know. I just... I think when you've been exposed to any sort of critique, I I can't believe any hype because it's in, it, it's equal to the critique and I don't want to look at the critique, so no. I'd rather just have the, like, yeah. no noise. Yeah. But I think it's... I'd probably sit somewhere in the middle in, in terms of... I do think, you know, the sum of who you are is exactly what you've said. But I do definitely seek some sort of magic and I've I think I've always been quite sort of open and exploring that and like needing a bit of that magic if I'm honest with you and I'm not pinning it to anything I, I'm certainly not bound to a certain religion or doctrine but I'm deeply interested in other stuff yeah I and guess I, I I have increasingly I I've never been it seems some of my work would make people think I'm contemptuous of spiritual belief and stuff and I certainly have asserted that I have no spiritual beliefs in the past I haven't really altered except that I the, my thinking has altered in that I believe what humans are are storytelling creatures and what cultures are are collections of narratives, right? And as w with many people, that uh, Harari book, Sapiens, kind of just guided me in my thinking a bit, you know, the the idea that money is a shared narrative, that it, it's not a real thing, it's just something we all agree on, value, uh, or the notion of nationhood, or even the notion of race, the notion of culture, they're all shared narratives, they're accepted narratives, they're not real, except to the extent that believing makes it so, to quote Shakespeare, I suppose, ish, um, <laughs> that we... We define ourselves by our stories and so I guess my magic is in the stories I make and in the music I make and some people would call that my, the spiritual side of me Yeah, is my seeking beauty and um, humour and stuff in, in the stories. I, I, I think all we are is stories and so if part of the story one person likes is that they think they might come back as a squirrel or someone else might think they're going to go to heaven and have some virgins or raisins, depending on your interpretation of the text. And, you know, whatever, it's like, it's fine. You, the, you, you, the stories we tell ourselves sort of can be judged by their utility, as mm. in, does it make you nicer? Does it make you kinder? Does it make you happier? Is it good for your kids? And the answer is very often yes. I, I'm yeah. pretty optimistic about hope. people. Yeah. It's just, unfortunately, we hear about the fuckwits. We hear about the, yep. the fundamentalists and the... Yep. And then you, you know, you have a revolution in the 70s in Iran and you put the whole fucking thing back. So 
you know, shared narratives aside, I think theocracies need to fucking burn to the ground. Mm. <laughs> but anyway, <It's> just, <laughs> patriarchal yeah, theocracies like are be... <laughs> bad. But, um, you know, bring it on. Yeah. Mm. We've covered so much. I don't know. And also nothing at all. And also no. nothing at all. That is the We've crux of my nowhere. podcast. <laughs> of, of is that life. we talk about everything. Yeah, we talk you about everything. You will die having got we nowhere. Found, we found out nothing. Yeah. The end. Yeah. Like that is essentially yeah. the whole yeah. point of me. Yeah. So getting on with it is good. Getting Isn't with it, it is so good. Getting on with good. it is good for happiness. It is. And potentially making your own pizzas. That's my take on it. Definitely. Definitely pizza oven. That's the only key. It's the way out. <laughs> Fucking hell. That's you're what gonna I'm, I'm going to try it out. You're going to use it just, twice. I know I am, but just humour me in yeah. this one, okay? I've, yeah. we've bloody, I was going to say I built it. I didn't. Kevin built it. He's the builder. Um, Nature. Yeah. Nature. Nature. Nature's the other one. Yeah. We've got to fucking get out. Yeah. That humans were not meant to live in boxes. Nope. Got to get out. Yeah. That's huge for me. Yeah. That's what is part your... of why I live moved back to Australia. I'm like, I've got to go back to where I have a relationship with trees and ocean and sand. Do you know what? I'm, I, I'm, um, I constantly feel... Uh, what does Sarah Wilson call it? There's some sort of weird visceral discomfort in being human in this age where, I can't think what she called it now, but um, I feel exactly the same. I want to be out in nature. I want to have a relationship with it. But I also know that loads of things I'm doing are completely screwing it over. I feel sort of sick about it mm. every time I buy some blueberries and I'm in the plastic thing and I don't know what the fuck to do with this plastic thing because I'm pretty sure it's not being recycled even if I put it in the blue bin. And I that one bothers me greatly. I know. Yeah. Well, look, thank you and have a brilliant rest of your birthday. I don't feel like I said anything interesting. but well, um, I think you said loads of interesting all that things. Stuff Are you mad? I, all that stuff where I talked about myself, that must be really, that's, <laughs> that's going to be entertaining. No one wants to talk about me. It's it the whole point. I'd rather talk about you. No, I've, I've, everyone's bored of me waffling on. I did radio for years. Yeah. It's boring as hell. This yeah. is much, much you more interesting. You were famously boring in those Famously years. boring. Yeah. So much so that I left. Yeah. Like, I had to get out. It's weird that you had a job at all. It's I like, know. Yeah. This is so not a job. It's a very strange thing doing press. I I realize, you know, I've never done any therapy or anything. I realize I kind of use, and because I'm not a celebrity, I'm not in the news cycle. I don't turn up to things. I don't get free clothes or sell watches. I'm, I just do my work, and then I try to sell my work. So I only do this shit when I'm got something to flog. So uh, Matilda the musical, the movie, uh, <laughs> Upright season two coming on November twenty first, and back the uh, streaming version of my live show coming in late November as well. Sometimes you have to be a little bit naughty. There's a children's book coming out next April. Um, I don't and... have to do any of that. In no, the that's that right. Yeah, yeah, that's done right. It for um, me. Also, there are nude pictures of me on celebritydick.com. <laughs> um, uh, the um, the I, I think I use sort of obnoxiously I I subconsciously use these I, I I'm checking in on myself because everyone wants yeah. to ask about me and I go, oh well where am I at? Okay. And you get in this thing, I did eleven hours of press yesterday. And the way my brain works, I just rather than and I'm jet lagged and blah blah rather than slowing down and getting saying less and giving more and more pat answers, I go the opposite way. I just go I find myself almost manic and someone will say, so how do you feel? And I go, <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my God, I, no one needs to know any of this shit. And I'm a little over Sherry and a little bit, it's like, fucking hell, how yeah, are you going to write You walk away like you've, you've purged and, you're, and you've got the self-awareness and you're like, cool, I'm done. But then, then you have to not read the articles they write because I've given them so much material they can construct whatever story they want. But that's why the podcasts are good because that's it right. is what it is. Yeah. Like this is an unedited, yeah. people just listen There's to this. There's no hiding that I'm a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to know. They're going to hear it. <laughs> just gonna, they're going to hear that. But in a, I, I would never read a print interview because I don't know what that version of me is and it certainly won't be the one that I feel I am. And if no. it is, I want to puke. So oh, it's I just, can't bear it. No, yeah. no, no. It, they're never to be read. But why to. don't I shut up then? Why, why do I feel so compelled to say everything? It's just, I'm just, I don't know, ridiculous. But I had decided a, a couple of years ago, I went, I have to get better at press at just 
sticking to the line, talking about the show. No, no. And I need to edit myself. And I thought, actually, fuck it. If I have a brand, it's that I say what I think and I try to articulate complex ideas as well as I can. And so whatever the downside of that is, I'll just cop. That's what we're here for. Yeah. In our little shed. In our little shed. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It is. I love my shed. I absolutely live in here. I love it. Um, it's the podcast that won't, it won't end. This podcast won't end. No, I sort of don't want it to, I think, but I, no, it must. I don't. Yeah. I don't get to see you very often. I, I mean, know. I've only seen you three times ever or something. I, I, I know. You're quite nice. Well, I've very much loved this, actually. Yeah. I'll go beyond like. Okay, it's been okay. phenomenal. Well, I, okay. I don't, yeah. You don't have to reciprocate. No, I loved it. It's very, you. very nice. Very nice. Um, Shall I say that that is the end officially? It's up to you. I think so. Okay, that's the end. Bye now. Bye.